All right. Well, we've got our, what's well, August, August 1st, uh, month of August, uh, brands and uh, outliers looking at all sorts of uh, areas of culture. Super excited. It's, it's always a great presentation. So we're starting with um, VC investment as usual. I kind of took a different path on this one because this is usually the, I don't know, I'm going to call it the dud, but it's like we never get that excited. So I try to just bring in different kinds of content here. This was just fascinating to me. Like, so they, if you think of computing in the aggregate, what it costs to compute, these are like the different inputs to computing. Look at what they're forecasting for software engineers. So basically they're saying that OpenAI's code interpreter, it was already good at, ChatGPT was already good at coding, but this is just like the next level up where it's like, if you're a software engineer, you should be very scared right now because it's like, you know, your value is getting completely, you know, absorbed by ChatGPT in the very near future. And so it's like, that's awesome that it's like dropping and you know, these people will find other jobs, but it's just like this steep of a drop in the forecast was pretty wild to me. Similar thing here. They're really, you know, remember the brand Chegg that you, uh, we probably came across it when we were doing the um, yeah. uh, photo map uh, uh, competitive set. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's not the right brand, but um, anyway. Yeah, they think Chegg is the first brand that's really said, okay, you're done because of uh, ChatGPT. A lot of brands are, uh, but like what's happened to their um, valuation here as a result of ChatGPT is it's it's pretty it's pretty swift and you know pretty pretty incredible here. What's what's happening? Yeah, I think, think Chegg, that... yeah, it was, it was their earnings call where they talked about like I was the first time and only time I heard a company openly say like, hey, we're in serious trouble because of this new AI. Do we think that there's a contagion here to traditional uh, colleges? I'm kind of wondering, like, obviously you're gonna hit these businesses first because, you know, their cash flow is most responsive. But I, I mean, I wonder what this looks like down the road with, you know, traditional degrees and how it's gonna impact those. This here, it's like, you know, I think it was 10, 15 years ago when it felt like everyone worked at a startup. This is, you know, this is the push for efficiency. Now you can see no matter what size company you are, startups are trying to operate more leanly and, and reduce the headcount in a, in a, like a competitive funding environment. One lever that everybody's trying is how do we reduce staff and awesome time for that with, with AI. So, you know, it's, it's not surprising that we're, we're seeing this for sure. I, what I heard is kind of interesting is that like what AI does differently is, is you reduce a m bunch of costs on engineers, but you increase your cost on hardware. Uh, and so we're kind of seeing this this transition in, in terms of the kind of infrastructure startups require, at least in the AI space, which is kind of interesting. So um, uh, what typically happens, it seems, is a lot of that money ends up just getting funneled into NVIDIA because they're, they're producing most of the chips. Right, right. And it's like... This whole presentation could have been if we wanted it to be this industry, that industry, every industry, there is an AI innovation happening. So it's like we just like, you know, like eventually you had to like stop those because you'd like you just know that like every single industry uh -huh. there's there was something So the next slide. Um, maybe, you know, this Sequoia uh, splintered into three entities geographically situated, um, mainly because of escalating global tensions and uh, complicated regulatory environment. As a result, it just became easier to like, we're gonna be three companies operating in different areas of the, of the globe. It's like, what's interesting to me about this is like, reverse globalization has now reached, you know, venture capital. Like there's been a broader reverse globalization move at the same time as we're becoming globalized, you know, that's not going away, but there's this, you know, reverse globalization happening and it's beginning to happen in different, different areas. And this was a pretty big sign of that, I, I felt. I feel like that creates a lot of room for more sort of stringent, you know, a lot of times like people follow other countries legislation. I feel like I wonder if we're moving to a paradigm where there's just a much more distinct like kind of legislative regi regimes in different countries. And I wonder like that's a sign of what's to come and that like it used to be we everyone sort of met the gold standard often what would happen like in the, in the states california sets the most strict laws everyone copies those laws all the companies just operate by the strictest laws but here like yeah maybe that's not the rule anymore yeah um here you know this is this is like if you look closely you can see that the story is not that bad yes overall funding fell um by 27 percent in the last quarter here in the u.s 
But if you discount what you know the mega rounds from OpenAI and Stripe, it would have actually increased by 19%. So it's like, uh, it's just so how big those rounds were for those two two companies throughout the whole thing. So it looks like a 27% decline, but it's actually, if you take those out, a 19% rebound. So that's it's just, you know, kind of a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. So uh, the recession never happened. Uh, <laughs> unless you are, unless you're in uh, the smart home tech uh, industry. It's just like, this is like, look at 2022 and so far 2023 year to date. It's like, do we not care about funding smart home tech startups anymore? It's just so interesting that there's so much money to go around and it has to go somewhere. And it's just the latest thing, the latest thing. And then it just quickly so moving around so fickly. And uh, yeah, this is just a thing of the past. It's like, you know, everything's AI now. So it's like, okay, we don't want to, if you're not an AI powered smart home, I'm sure these companies just don't yet exist, but they will. So this will rebound. So it's just like, oh, okay. I think I was interpreting this as probably a lot of, smart home companies coming to market weren't yet AI powered. And that's why we're seeing this, but maybe that's like not the, the right, the right reading. I see this as like the end of the pandemic. Everyone's, everyone's going outside finally, you know? Um, and so like, it's kind of dry. Like, obviously there was so much attention on home, which I'm, I'm sure it like fueled the narrative for investors um, in 20, like 21, 22. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Cause 21 and 22. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this before, too, but it's, it continues to same sort of idea continues to drop. Also, Metaverse had a huge 2021, 2022, but it's um, down 76 percent um, year over year in, in funding, which is pretty, pretty shocking. And if you go to the next slide, I deliberately put this here. Um, because, you know, with activations like this in the Metaverse, I can't see why the funding would be this low. <laughs> When you can go to the Mayo verse and um, lay in a pool of mayo or fire mayo out of a hose all over your house and onto your giant thing of pizza, like I don't know why the funding for this is going down when this is this is awesome. This is Wyden and Kennedy too. So you know, I don't know. These things take a long time. Or like, I'm just like, who is this for? When you see things like yeah. this, like I'm not, I'm not like you know, cynical. I like mayonnaise as much as the next person, but who like <laughs> who spends their time doing this? I, I really, I really don't know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I kind of think of this like how the internet reacted to cats, like these kind of like bizarre experiences of the, you know, the, the you know, metaverse version of like how the 2.0 internet was cats, like cat memes. It's just, it's, it's never what you expect, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I was like, look, if you look at this video, it's kind of fun. I was like, it, it, it did look kind of fun to spray mayonnaise all over a piece of pizza in the metaverse, but yeah. <laughs> This is a slide after my own heart. It's almost like I put it in the deck. Um, big data is out on earnings calls after a peak in 2013 and 2015. Big data didn't go anywhere. In, in fact, like yeah. we're, it's more enshrined than it's ever been. But we just don't call it big data anymore. And so I just like this is such a hype cycle. It's like it was an example mm -hmm. to me of like cultural branding. You'd like somebody in culture throws out a term and it sticks and it starts to get used around. Like it's almost like we brand something collectively as a culture. No one person is like responsible for like branding a buzzword, even though it starts probably with somebody. But like, you know, it's just it's like we're over it. So we don't call it big data anymore. It's just it's just data. And it's just I think yeah. that, that was just funny to me. Um, this looks at um, fintech. Like what I didn't put in here, um, Latin America, for reasons I'm not sure, is the only um, market in the in the world that fintech funding is going up. Uh, but everywhere else, it's 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 going down, and I'm not sure what that means about Latin America. Is it probably just a developmental stage? Um, but it's it's definitely down big time, um, and digital health too. I think that was probably another pandemic bump where we're all needing to see a doctor online and um, can't in, in in person. Feels like that's kind of a bit of a bit of the come down from um, the crypto space too. You know, you had such a flood of capital that you just kind of you rode that wave out in the same way that like, you know, smart homes just sort of, we rode that wave, you know, we funded um, the bulk of them and then, you know, you can kind of see who's going to make it and who's not after that. All right. Cultural, cultural narratives. Now it gets fun. Got the, got the stuff out of the way. Yeah. So this first one just, it was like a trending topic um, the, called the dopamine detox, essentially, um, you know, just with everybody constantly like being online, we've created something called dopamine de uh, detox as a way to sort of 
um, create like this time where you're away from your phone um, and detoxing from, you know, your TV, your smartphone, your gaming device or whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, yeah, it says right here, it includes behaviors such as limiting the number of times they pick up their phone in a day, enjoying meals without phones on the table and not checking phones for at least <clears throat> an hour after waking up. I've actually seen like some events where people like actually have like a bucket at the front and then you have to like leave your phone there, I think for like the evening or something like that. Um, it's just interesting yet that we have to actually, you know, obviously create times and limits for these things. I myself um, now have a, this month, I'm trying to do like a 45 minute limit on social media, which is going to be really difficult. Personally, that's, but, um, that's near impossible. I don't know. How I know. Do I don't, I don't know either. Um, I have to find other things to fill my time with now, but um, I don't know, maybe it'll be good. We'll see. I will keep you guys posted to see if I, if I survive. We're culture obsessed with the detox and like, why, what does that mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> you see detox language everywhere. Like, and I'm not just talking like spirits, like, you know, even though like non-alcoholic beverages of trending also, but like um, digital detoxes, social media detoxes, dopamine detoxes. It's just like, we're a detox obsessed culture. And that's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, and there's so many detox packages you can buy at like all the juice bars in LA. Um, detoxifying, like if you're always talking about like toxic parents or toxic siblings or toxic relationships, there's a bunch of detox language around, oh. um, psych stuff too. Somebody sent me a Tim Ferriss video where I don't know who he was talking to, but he was talking about how, um, his life has always been about optimization, but now he's focusing on like de-optimizing and slowing down and feeling things. Like the big thing for him was like, I'm going to start feeling stuff. And I was like, well, that's, that's a long time to realize you have to start feeling stuff to live your <laughs> life. But he had like, a, he has a huge audience of all of these people who follow him, myself included, who, you know, we've had this huge, he's created this huge conversation and feeling slowing down and feeling and not doing everything the optimal way was yeah. never a part of that conversation. Like we were trying to do away with that for so long and hearing him say that was like, whoa, we are in the next epic of Tim Ferriss. Like something has shifted. Can you send me that? Yes. I'll send it to you. For yeah. Like that article I'm working on, that'd be nice. Yes, 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 yes. I, I do think that to your point, but like there is, we've now we're in the, the, the tra awkward transition period to like a new, paradigm where like the thesis is because a lot of this came out of silicon valley culture of like that technology culture defined like the whole zeitgeist of like everything must be optimized right tim ferris was the face of that narrative um mm -hmm. and so now it's kind of interesting because like it's like we want to optimize unoptimized <laughs> being unoptimized like we're in that you know our behaviors are old but our, our beliefs are new and so we're kind of in this awkward state of like how do we do that i think my bet would be that like we're going to see a lot of products like people are going to productize the the unoptimization narrative and this niche, especially in the digital realm, which would be very interesting. It would be interesting to have like the metaverse address this too. I'm just you know? thinking too. <laughs> like, you're, are you replacing your addiction with something else, or are you actually treating it? Like, there's you know, it's it's kind of going to be very messy, but like for sure, there's there's money to be made here. And without getting like too far afield, just, do you remember that article we were discussing about the extension of personal space? How yes. we feel like our personal space is expanding. There's what been the this shift articles? accelerated over the last eight years uh, that like we now see every the environment as hazardous, as full of toxins, as dangerous mm -hmm. to me, my physical health and my mental health. So that therefore detox culture. I think I just answered my question, right? So it's like mm -hmm. as as we like come to see the environment as bad, then we need, we need to, so, but that's a, that's not good for society, right? Like, you know, you yeah. think yeah. if that is your, like, if everyone's operating ethic is that, like, that's not a connective, like first, mm -hmm. you know, way of being in the world. So it's like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like more, more. Yeah. That's a really good point. We are now, I wouldn't say imagining, I think some of the thing, these things are threats. I think some of them are overblown, but like, if we believe that literally the space between people is toxic like that doesn't bring people closer together that's very interesting zach oh i have a, i have a future signal we should look out for which is that if this vector of detoxifying is expanding socially then a really fascinating thing i i don't know like what, what the over under bet is but 
when will we take this narrative to politics and say detox to detox the government you know like i wonder if it's really going to expand like is that are we five decades away five i don't know that away? sounds pretty similar to a campaign promise uh that we heard not too long ago Maybe it's just uh, we're already doing it with different language but <laughs> it does feel that like this this rhetoric is um is definitely you know approaching a lot of those areas um, so this one was really interesting. It was from a newsletter that I came across um, recently and how this hashtag human core is like the new trending term. I don't know if this is like just trending now or if this is like, you know, um, if it's just going to fade away like in the next couple of weeks or something like that. But people have become sort of obsessed with like filming other people and just like, you know, humans, quote unquote, like humans being humans um and uh yeah just this essence of just kind of like capturing people and just very like mundane like sort of normal quote-unquote normal moments um and uh just sort of like you know romanticizing this idea i guess um yeah it's where, just, like, where, right here, where was like, this article from it's from a newsletter um i can i can share it with you after um that's fine. called i think it's embedded uh but yeah so uh, let's see here. Yeah, this, this she says it right here. Like these videos are popular because they satisfy a craving for authenticity, a desire that has grown stronger and stronger over the past five years as the internet has careened towards the flashy and performative. So, yeah, interesting. And then you know her quote was like, "Human core becoming a thing as we just like learn about you know aliens might being real. Like maybe it's suspicious. Um, you could I guess read into that, but uh, or not. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting trend that. I think everything inevitable. I feel like so many people are sticking the word core at the end of something and making it like a micro trend. It's like a yeah. lot of a lot of core wow. trends going on. <laughs> I, I think yeah. I see like I mean there was norm core, right? Which kind of normalized normal and then like human I like I wonder like what if you had to draw a line, like where does that take is it like trauma core is next? Like we're going inward, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure trauma core already exists. Like that sounds like something I've already heard. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> See, exactly. That makes my point. Yeah. And it's all very high fidelity society. Like there's an influencer that Holly turned me on to, and I forget her name, but like she's always discussing trends and she does it for like an um uh a stock site, like a visual stock site. And you hear her talk for a week and you're like, there's like a thousand trends. Like what, what are we even talking about anymore? These are just tiny little patterns that are like fleeting that come and go. Is, is this just our limited way of just like human core feels like we've come full circle. This is just us like dealing with reality. Like we have to call it core <laughs> so it's a thing. But like this is just yeah. us coming back to reality. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so full circle that the trend is just being alive. Well, I'd imagine I would, I would really enjoy this. Yeah, it's definitely supposed to be very kind of like, I don't know what the word is, sort of like feely and um, supposed to be like very human-like, I guess, or just remind you that you're a human. I don't know. Yeah, like John Louis said, it's oh, it's good. like we have to like <laughs> label, we have to label it somehow to remind ourselves that we exist or something as like human beings. Yeah. Um, like where so... is the line between just existing and human core? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like, the, yeah, the fact that we need to like label just yeah being alive is yeah um this, interesting. this hasn't shown up in my feed yet but i feel like it's going to now that i've said it out loud yeah your okay. phone probably heard you already so <laughs> <laughs> um this next one here is also pretty to be said it's interesting i don't think it's that, that surprising um i do think that obviously our our culture has a tendency to try to capitalize on every little thing i think it's also just been like a um i, I feel like it's also been like a you know, characterized by like millennials too, or it's a characteristic of millennial generation as well in terms of just kind of with the economy and just like all these things having to monetize off of all of our passions has kind of become like a millennial trait, I feel like. Um, but yeah, this article is just talking about essentially how like nobody has hobbies anymore because they're all just trying to turn it into side hustles. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, in the US, 49% of people under 35 claim to have a side hustle. And like the number of times I come across on my TikTok feed, like multiple different ways of like making side, uh, doing side hustle type things. Um, they try to like cloak it in like, oh, this is like a fun way and passive way to like make more money. Um, but yeah, I've definitely been seeing it a lot more in terms of just kind of like side hustle content. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Are we sure like, you know, 
like hustle culture is over it really doesn't seem like it no like, you know, i feel the pressure no. of like you know turning your hobby into into a, a side hustle all the time it's like i don't yeah. my hobby's reading how do i do that i guess i could start a podcast or a youtube channel or a tiktok i'm not yeah. doing any of that mm-hmm. I'm a big loser that just sits in a chair and reads. Right. So it's like, you know, like there is this constant cultural pressure to, to like do more and like, you can never like s- slow, you know? I yeah. think one of the challenges too, that like social media probably massively exacerbates is that the people making the most noise are the people who are making money from said hobbies. And so there's probably like a decent contingent, but they're completely invisible who are actually doing it for fun because they're doing it for fun. It's not a job. And so I think that's kind of, one of the challenges is as social becomes more marketing than snippets of our lives. Like it's to your point, it's removed from the reality of these things. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can't even have sex anymore without like, you should be turning this into content that you should. (laughs) 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 Yeah. That's the full circle right there. Um, Speaking of kind of something related, I guess, but uh, I think Holly, Holly mentioned this person in our Slack once um, and she's become like this, like really like she's become a moment. Um, Her name is Pinky Doll and she's like this Canadian TikTok content creator. And basically she does these live streams in which she um, acts as an NPC character. So she has like multiple different phrases that she like repeats based on who, uh, but based on like what she's gifted. So like, um, yeah, she says things like, oh, ice cream, gang, gang, yes, 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 like all these things in a very much like a character animated way. But she's, I mean, I guess making a lot of money off of this. Um, but yeah, I mean, not exactly sure how much, but it's interesting because um, she's not the only person, but there's other people who have sort of um, adopted this type of content uh, monetization. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, like this, this person here, um, argues that the, this development reflects the increasing digitiz- dig- digitization of our lives and the growing popularity of simulation theory, the idea that we're all existing in a matrix style computer game and the NPC archetype is a way of embracing the absurdity of a fraught, anxious world. So interesting. It's very surreal to watch um, if you've ever watched it, but. You kind of can't stop watching her because she, I think, really straddles the line between like human and inhuman. And it's it's mm. kind of fun to watch. I do feel like this theme of surrealness is like coming through a lot of these different things, like human core feel. There's like an element of surrealness to it, you know, like where it's like it's almost real, but not quite like. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah we know what's coming we know what's in here and yeah i think that's the theme of this this presentation so let's talk about it like as Mm -hmm. we get the full run here for sure actually now that i'm thinking about it like so npc so i'm obviously not a gamer like npc is supposed to be like a character that's like not like you the main character but just somebody who is in the game right i think it's interesting like am i my like what i'm thinking out loud is uh, like what I'm thinking about is the fact the fact that like in this context, like me as a viewer, I'm still like the main character in this like simulation ah, scenario. Like, yeah, you know, it's like interesting. Yeah. like that. This is like NPCs are more popular than like I don't know, like a main character trying to like simulate something similar. Um, I don't know. It's like That's for the attention of us as main characters or something, as opposed mm-hmm. to the other. It way makes around. you the main character. I like that. That's interesting. Right. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Little Treat Culture, but it's become, it's like plastered like on t-shirts and like walls and like things like that basically now where, you know, after any little thing, like you kind of like treat yourself to like, I don't know, $5 hand soap or like that really expensive latte. Um, and it's become like another form of like self-care. The only other thing that I could, but the other thing that I think of that I can't get around is just that how it just encourages obviously consumerism and just just the, a sense of just like buying anything and everything at any moment, even for like the smallest thing. Um, but yeah, just an interesting little uh, trend that's happening. That also feels treat... like. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just say, can a little treat be a girl dinner? <laughs> okay, girl <laughs> dinner is actually kind of sad. I don't know why, like. I think I, I came across this creator who um, talked about how girl dinner is actually just like another symbol of how oppressed women are in terms of just like women like or like I guess she was more talking towards like maybe moms or 
you know, women who had families to take care of about like, you're preparing everything for everything, everybody else. And so you're left with literally like scraps or like, having to, you know, makeshift this some sort of dinner for yourself in order to like, you know, and now we're just calling it girl dinner. Um, but, and so I can't get that like audio out of, or like that person out of my head uh, whenever I come across so girl dinner. So this but. is 100% true, but girl dinner has always existed. Like there was an old, old, like, I think it was like a Nabisco commercial or something for one of their foods. And it's these three moms at a park. Like, honestly, I was a kid when I saw this commercial and they're describing what they ate for dinner the night before. And it's like really sad. Like I <laughs> ate like two Oreos that were left in the sleeve at the back of the pantry, a piece of um, half eaten cheese and, um, yeah. you know, my coffee from this morning. And it yeah. was like all these like and then like they talk about like their, you know, whatever single serving whole meal or whatever it was. But like, yeah, girl dinner is uh, I don't even know if that's that feels like a misnomer. That just feels like harried woman dinner. But yes, yeah. I relate. I relate. Um, so this next one, I don't know if anyone's heard like the phrase being Delulu. Um, it's just like a fun, kitschy way of saying like delusional. Um, <laughs> originally it was used in like dating context, but now it's apparently become a psychology hack for your career. So um, but kind of like similar to what we were just talking about, um, basically it's being used as a way for women to kind of build up confidence and like, you know, get that, you know, like promotion or like get that you know job that you you think that you're not qualified for but are very much qualified for and calling that being delulu or delusional um and just that it signals essentially that like we're still women are still not fully comfortable with like owning their ambition and cre being career oriented in a traditionally quote unquote like masculine way um and so yeah i just thought it was really interesting that they're using this phrase as a way to sort of like hype yourself up and like go do things that like you believe you can do even if they seem kind of quote unquote delusional even though they might not actually be that's interesting fake it until you make it gets a rebrand that's what i'm taking <laughs> and, uh, it does seem that, like all these cultural artifacts are so structured like i can't just like buy myself something nice it's like this is therapy you know i've like given it this frame and like i can't just be confident i have to be deluded and it's like it's just all of these things. We're creating these like constructs, you know, like almost like apps, but like, you know, like they're just like, it's everything is like this exterior cultural structure to it now, which is just interesting. But let me ask you, how much of it is like actual culture and how much of it is the algorithm rewarding you for like labeling it Delulu? Well, I think that's, it's, it's symbiotic, you know, it's, it's created yeah. that like, you know, and part of that's just like high fidelity society too. And that like it culture is so thick that you can like literally feel like, it around every single behavior. So this one I thought was interesting. I actually came across this on like TikTok, and then I just like, like was curious. So I like went to their website. Essentially what this does, it's like a chat GPT, uh, like GPT part algorithm that like analyzes all of your text conversations, like with your, from your, like between you and your ex. And then you basically get assessed like whether, you know, you guys are good together or really awful together um, based on like attachment style, communication, sexiness, like highlight, lowlights, cute moments and why it'll never work. It's like, I think it just starts an interesting conversation of like, okay, well, does it have to just be text with my ex? Like, could it be any conversation that I'm having with anybody in any sort of, you know, like one to one relationship? Um, and then the other thing that it made me think of was like, will people become more self-aware you know, like from things like this, so it's like if people were to like adopt this a lot more um, and is that good or is that bad? Because I can see it going both ways. Like the good part is obviously that you're much more aware of like what you're doing in the relationship. The other part of it is like, can this be used to also like manipulate people? Like, I don't know. Um, so that was like, those were my thoughts, but I'm curious to hear what y'all think. It made me think of like, this is replacing you obsessively asking your friends, like, you know, to like go over the breakup and like look at your texts and say what they think and like the constant validation of what happens. Mm -hmm. I feel like this replaces the friend group or the group chat. I, th yeah. I see it as closer to therapy. I think this is like therapy dressed up as a Buzzfeed quiz. Like, I think that's kind of yeah. how it's like a Trojan horse for like, you know, what is like a form of therapy like that, that is obviously AI facilitated. I think that like there is a lot more to come in this category. It's interesting how like, you know, we've talked about this before, like all of the ways we're just skinning a brand out of ChatGPT. Like why did, mm -hmm. what's your point, Rebecca? There's no reason this needed to be so specific. Uh, Cause I yeah. came across another version of this in this research that was about your writing style. 
So you were supposed to feed it all of your writing and it was going to tell you the dominant emotional tones that you were using. Uh, and that's all I can remember. But there was like four other things that it was it was deconstructing your own writing to help you become more self-aware as a writer of like your tendencies. And mm. so like same thing, just like, oh, that one's for yeah. writing. This oh one's for, God. you know, text with your ex. But really, it's just chat GPT self analyzing, you know, so it's interesting, like, you know, the, all of these. Are we going to see this like as this AI technology continues to evolve, just like light skinned brands over and over yeah. and over? I don't know. Yeah. Do you guys remember that that visual of Craigslist and how every single link became a business? I wonder if this the new version of that is that you look at the homepage of BuzzFeed and every quiz becomes a business, you know, AI business. Like, is, <laughs> is, is, so is that good. the new model? Yes. Yeah. Um, this was, um, interesting. So it's the effect of messaging over time are it's, we've been so conditioned in this country that we need to recycle and you know how it's the song and it's in the school curriculum. And like the cumulative effect of that over time is like, that is our default position. And a lot of times that's actually not the best use for what we should be doing with these things. And so recycling has been presented as panacea. And so we don't question it. So it's like, how do you uh, like well-intentioned of course but then how do you then update these like you know decades long psas to uh you know and so it's like how you can get like locked in to cultural knowledge that stays mm -hmm. forever that's that was what this one was saying i think the problem too is that these more sustainable ways to manage waste are probably a bit more nuanced and i don't know if it's easy for a government to like give nuanced messages about you know there are different ways to varying degrees that you can manage waste like it's the simple messages that get get through. So, yeah. These next few slides are kind of, they're all together. Um, they're all about how deep fakes have essentially, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Um, yeah. And we're starting to see this used in so many different ways. And like, we don't even know like where this is going or like all, any way you can use this, it will be used, um, good and bad. I want to watch the show. I wish it was in English, uh, but it's like one of the, you'd have to like overdub it. Um, deep fake love where, you know, you are in a villa with hot singles and you're seeing video of your partner doing things with these signal singles and you don't know if they're really doing it or if it's a fake. And so then you your relationship is put to the test. And it's like a really big show on Netflix right now. Um, but then this this newsletter is like, well, what happens when people just start to use this insidiously? You know, when they don't like, you know, when you can, you know, you can then just target it and use it in your own social life. Um, next one is, um, just trying to do an experiment to show that like women's soccer, you would like it as much as men's soccer if you just yeah. didn't know it was women. So they, you know, they put the men's faces on the women and like, you know, sure enough, people wanted to watch this. They thought it was high quality soccer play. And, um, yeah, so that was, that's a, this was an ad recently here for the, yeah, uh, women's world cup. I, th I think we have to talk like coming back to things being surreal, like, this is, I mean, this defect technology as it enters the media zeitgeist is very surreal in a very literal sense. And I, I think it's really going to erode trust in reality because, you know, to us, like social media content, all of these things, like where is the line between this happened, this didn't happen, like the intention is real, but the behavior is fake. Like it just, I think we're going to, just the line of like where real ends and surreal begins is going to get awfully blurry. Like that is a, I don't know what happens to it. You know, we had like a generation that was raised where everything was performative. Everything was put online, you know, social media, like what happens when you're raised in a world where you don't know what's real? Like you actually don't know if like, did the president say that? Or is that wall street bets? Like it just, it's, you know, you just can't trust information in a, in a meaningful way. Like that's a, yeah, it's interesting. Did you, did you, Welcome. um, I will, I will, I will allow you onto this, onto this wagon with me. You know, I, I've been accused of being negative before, but I'm just trying to be like, yeah, that's what I see coming. And so like, we got to get ahead of that and like, what's going to happen. And yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah. Did you touch world coin in this? We didn't No. I saw some stuff on it though. So world coin, if I remember correctly, is trying to deal with the issue of providence of like, did you make this or did you not? And so it's like, 
I think they had something to do with like an iris scan or <laughs> some biomarker scan that would prove that this was authentically you. And that to be a counter, and this is, you know, obviously funded by OpenAI, to be a counter to all this fake content. If you can take the likeness of someone, then how do you ensure that this is really them? And that's the intent, I believe, behind WorldCoin is to deal with essentially the issue of like wh exactly what we're talking about here. So interesting concept. We'll have to see an execution. Obviously, the big question is like, are you going to trust something like this with your, you know, your retina scan, your iris scan? Like, that's all an auxiliary question. But um, it does seem that we're now having to face the problems of living in such a surreal world. And then uh, a couple more here. Um, just a different take at this. I didn't know who Alice Regina was, but she's very <laughs> beloved in Brazil. And she passed away young, and evidently her daughter is still alive, and she's a singer. And um, this VW, Volkswagen ad, resurrected her, and so she can sing alongside her daughter. And it touched a huge cultural nerve in, in Brazil. Some people loved it. Others were like, she didn't consent to this. Um, you know, in fact, uh, maybe her political life while she was alive indicated, you know, gave us an indication that she wouldn't have been in support of something like this. And so, um, you know, obviously legacy, legacy likenesses, but just another way to you know, use this technology. And this one I shared on Slack earlier this morning. I watched this video. Um, uh, it's just PSA trying to get people to be more careful about, you know, images they share online. So um, if you didn't watch it, they took two uh, pictures of this uh, girl, and then the technology aged her to present day, and then present day she's speaking to you know her parents and saying like, "Be careful! It doesn't take much. Uh, you know, all you need is just a little bit to start to um, you know then create you know fake fake me." And we don't know who's going to do that. We don't know what their purposes are going to be. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what this one was was saying. I did see this. I saw it when it came out and I felt at the time that they made a mis It was a great PSA, you know, did everything it was supposed to do. Um, aside from that, I feel like PSAs, this one fell into like the climate change trap in that it just focused on the wrong feelings. The way it was presented was if you're watching this and you're a parent, it really manipulates your feelings and it's meant to manipulate your feelings. And you feel incredibly guilty and embarrassed like for, for sharing pictures of your parents or of your kids. And I feel like when you hijack people's feelings too much, it repels them from the message a little bit. Because I'd imagine people watching this would be like, well, kind of like I did. Uh, well, they have a private account, you know, or like, you know, I only share with close friends, you know, through the Instagram settings or whatever. And... There was, if like, if it was followed by like, you know, a message about like something easy you could do right now to reduce the potential impact on your child or a positive ending to this, I feel like it could have gone a lot further. But when something makes you feel that uncomfortable, you're more likely, I think, to kind of just shy away from the message because it's not that the message is wrong. It's that you feel like your feelings were hijacked. And I think brands need to be kind of careful about that. You know, like when you have a friend that like, have you ever talked to somebody and it feels like they're telling you their story and it's like these, they tell you like an awful story or a scary story or whatever. And you just get the sense that they're kind of like hijacking your emotions for their benefit. You know, Zach's nodding his head. I, I've known people like that. You don't feel good around them. You don't, you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to be around them. And I felt like this one straddled the line a little bit. I'm not, I'm not criticizing it. It's just something that made me think of. I think that's a really great too. point. I think. So was a, yeah, it's a was, really great point. If you go for the emotional jugular as a brand, you best not miss. And <laughs> it's a fine, it's a fine line for sure. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like that comedy workshop we took where like you can't ratchet up the tension this much and not release it somehow. It leaves mm -hmm. people like on a cliff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, yeah. To me, like one of the notes here is that like, I remember there was a great interview with Daniel Kahneman talking about like the psychology of climate change. And how one of the, the factors that is so aggressive here is that we have a really big discount rate for things that happen in the future. Like something awful could happen in 10 years, but it's 10 years away, who cares? You know, and it's like climate change is so far away, we just discount it. And like 
the narrative here is that when they're older, something bad will happen. And I was like, well, that's that's future me's problem. I think there's a strong discount rate, kind of to Jasmine's point, like immediate act. Like this isn't a contemporary problem, not a future problem. Yeah, this um, I think this why I included this because we've all seen what's going on with the throwing of things that are like that speaks to how cultural activity becomes a meme. And so it gets repeated, like, you know, good or bad violence and good behavior gets memed. And but like somebody recently threw their ashes uh, at, at Pink, their mom's ashes. And <laughs> yes. Pink's like, I don't know how I feel about this, like during the show. And like, I really like this psychologist's explanation. Um, you know, when you, you have, with these parasocial relationships, when you get so close, it's just created that deeper sense of connection um that like really blurs the line and so like that's why you um want to do that and it's just yeah it's just mm -hmm. interesting yeah this reminds me of um i don't know if everyone's it's been all over the internet that that person that threw water at cardi b yeah on stage and then she like threw the mic back and then I, that one and then also um doja cat and like her whole thing with her fans is like been interesting oh how um, she doesn't love issue. them yeah, how she's like, if like, she basically like, you know, it's called Doja Cat. So the, the fans that like, call themselves kittens. And then she was like, yes, basically yes. saying that you're y'all are dumb for calling yourselves that or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, this parasocial relationship thing. Um, let's, I want to focus on number three here. You may have seen this. Um, Ikea has retrained 8,500 of its call center operators as interior design advisors now that they're using an AI-powered customer service chatbot. So arguably, this is more fulfilling work for these people. I'm sure they would love to talk about how your, you know, your mom um, coffee table accents your, you know, Joshua um, sofa. So it's like maybe, you know, like maybe there's an opportunity for this, you know, like to see some positive in um in ai taking our jobs but then of course like there's a lot of ai interior design services you know so it's like how all like how all of these things are going to interact it's just it's it's interesting and it's like kudos to ikea for like you know not laying these people off it's like they saw this as an opportunity to add a a, a competency um, yes so yeah and i think that's a really good point because every company will have this choice about whether they lay off a faction of people and have ai replace them um, or have AI replace them, but then retrain them uh, to do something that's higher level. And you could kind of see it as a competitive advantage. I think it's a short term view versus a long term view. I can see that. Yeah, we're already evaluating companies today by how they treat their employees. And I see this as the next frontier of that, perhaps. Yeah. The real question is that like, do they hang on to them or in 10 years after they've trained the ai sufficiently then they let them go and now it's you know and the ai does it all so like that's i think the, <laughs> the cynic in me is that like you know you've got a training force of 8,500 people you know like are we as ai advances like is that temporary or is that you know a sign of what's to come more permanently um the next slide was um just a cultural comment of like we used to have these just irredeemably awful bad guys in our media and they're gone what's going on like now every bad guy is complicated um like they're human uh there's nobody that's just unequivocally bad and you know that's i don't know what to make of that i just thought it was interesting i think the consciousness of people in general has just kind of been elevated like we understand that people just aren't two-dimensional that's why it's so unsatisfying to watch a movie like titanic so far after the fact because every character was so two-dimensional it was almost oh. cartoonish and I think um, it's just a, I would say it's just a sim signal of the fact that people have become more sophisticated. Their consciousness is generally more advanced about the world and the people around them. Yep, mm -hmm. right take. I think given Ursula, enough time, yeah. so low fidelity society. Mm. I think given enough time, and this will for back. sure be trauma core, where you know that's that's the real enemy <laughs> here. That that must exist. I don't. And in fact, I've seen people talk about the backlash to all this trauma language, but they're not labeling it trauma core yet. So mm -hmm. it's there. The conversation's happening. Yeah. 
But I mean, the whole um, generation raised on that narrative of like, you know, there are no bad people. There's just bad experiences, which is arguably, you know, like, I don't know what to use the word woke, but like, it's it's much more aware. But like, that's also super nuanced for like a four year old watching a, a Disney movie. Yeah, I think I was, it's interesting because obviously this is, these movies are made for kids. So it's the question is like, will kids understand this nuance? And I think like, um, I was listening to a an interview with Greta Gerwig. She was talking about the Barbie movie, and the interviewer asked, "Is Barbie is this movie a, an adult movie or is it for kids?" Um, and she was talking about essentially that like, well, she believes that um, that kids do have like she has a four year old herself, and saying that like I think that kids have a sophistication to them that like I think if you do it right, like they can understand. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because like obviously I grew up with a generation of this of like, you know, there's just bad people in the world and like no redeemable qualities at all. Um, but this whole new generation is going to grow up with an entire like, seri- you know, you know, roster of movies that in which are very much more introspective and nuanced. Um, so it'll be interesting. I don't know what their how their opinions will evolve like when they become adults. Well, this is the bedrock of high fidelity society. Is that, you know, I mean, this, the, those are the two dimensions we're doing away with right here. Yeah, even like modern Disney movies don't even have like real bad guys. Like, who was the bad guy in Moana? Or. Yeah, it was the was internal the... conflict of like yeah. the. Um, Frozen yeah. 1 had some minor characters that were bad guys. Frozen 2 <laughs> had no bad guys. Frozen 2 was much better, FYI. This is just interesting. Mm-hmm comment death doulas uh growing in popularity makes so much sense uncertainty just like maybe it's just me go ahead working with the doula right now for birth like you could i see easily why it's like this is the thing for for death it's like hospice workers were death doulas and you know it's, i'm not surprised that it's like this is an easy side hustle you know if your hobby is death you can then like turn, turn it into a turn it into a side hustle I don't know if it would be easy but uh <laughs> speaking as someone who experienced the passing of a parent and thought, thinking hospice was going to do anything and being like sorely wrong. Um, yes, there's it's just a gaping hole because nobody tells you how to handle not just like the very physical aspects of like how to help somebody die, but how to how to handle that transition for yourself. And I was just talking at a dinner party like thought well, this Friday that if I could have another life, I would be this because having done it for my dad. It and being a general i mean zach knows how far my beliefs around spirituality go but generally is skeptical outside of that realm i felt like of all the things that would give me meaning in this life this would be the closest thing to what people feel when they have religion because it just makes you see how how much gravity and importance there is to life but also the lightness to it it's just things go, things pass. That's what I felt. Like I really was able to accept for a minute that like, okay, it's the cycle of life. Like things perish. They're never going to be in this form again. When you live through it, you it's kind of um, a calming experience, I guess, if you have any anxieties around those things like I did. Has you could do that in your second life. You should. I know in my second <laughs> life. <laughs> I kind of, I, I want to, but you do, I'd imagine you still have to kind of like have nurse-like knowledge because there's so many things that go wrong with the physical body at the end and you have to decide, am I here to help them live an extra day or am I here to help them live one less day with more comfort, which is an arduous decision. Mm-hmm. For sure. <laughs> I'm so into this. I uh, like, this is just like, I, I need to do a dopamine detox from this idea. Basically that like, there's this notion of revenge partying, uh, because we've all been locked up. So it's like, let me do the most absurd, ostentatious, maximalist thing because I want to. Um, and they, the trend in JWT called it operatic escapism, which is, you know, that's a pretty maximalist term as well. Like, you know, carve <laughs> middle finger to the, uh, gods of restraint. Um, just, what yeah. are these parties like? Is oh, I wish I knew. You know, like I got they old. Don't talk about pandemic. It? Yeah. They don't talk about it in here. Oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't click. We were moving fast today. <laughs> <laughs>
This uh, this feels very much like uh, you know the Art Deco era, you know, where like we're we're kind of at this age. Like it does feel, you know, the fourth turning thing that we're right on, on the cycle of like reaching the next wave, which is more about abundance and these kind of things. And like it does feel reminiscent of like the Art Deco era and this like deliberate opulence, like Gatsby esque kind of things. Like I mean, it rhymes, you know, it definitely rhymes with that. So I came across this article today, um, and it's, it is kind of, you know, obviously kind of a little bit scary, um, essentially like more women are dying from alcohol and it's not because of mommy wine culture. I think we've, I think part of it is, is that, yes, we have normalized, um, drinking a lot, especially like, you know, from being stressed and all that stuff like that. But that's, it's also just kind of like, we're not facing like the fact that that is in fact something that's causing a lot of death, um, and uh, just like not just calling it mommy wine culture doesn't solve the problem in terms of just you know how like women are way more stressed and like they feel like this is the only way they can cope with it and how like obviously covid obviously like made this a lot a uh, lot more intense in terms of just like you know drinking and things like staying at home etc et um and so yeah uh let's see here and and the fact that like uh alcohol affects women's bodies like way differently than for men I just learned mm. that today. Um, wow. I just learned that today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it takes double the amount for men to have the same effect that it has on women. Um, so it's that, yeah, that was surprising to me at least. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's just, this was like, yeah, this came out like yesterday. So yeah. Definitely from like a lot of the like the longevity communities and stuff like that. It's it's I mean, the wind is blowing that like, you know, we're kind of getting over alcohol, at least at, like the health conscious that like they're really it's it has such a negative impact on sleep. And so all these people with sleep trackers, you know, like the smartest sleep trackers and things are really telling people like the reality of it. So I think there is going to be a very, very, very slow reckoning um around this um you know but yeah like for that. sure like I, I as this year as i've had like you know more like a sober month here and then like you know, like if you have wine or something like it's so clear it's so obvious that you just do not sleep as well it's, it's like it's an immediate like effect like it, at any amount really like even just like a little bit i feel like and mm -hmm. it's just like it's it's like and once you know that there's like no going back um so yeah, for sure. But then we also made that a meme and then continued to do it anyway. So like, <laughs> like the morning after memes or whatever, or like, why do I do this to myself yes. type of meme? <laughs> this uh, next run of slides also near and dear to my heart because this was like kind of what I predicted in our future of entertainment workshop. And it's just nice to see, like, obviously this was already happening. It's not like I predicted it, but I arrived at it independently. This is this is happening already. Like character AI just raised a bunch of money, like to develop AIs based upon famous people that you can chat yeah. with. It's like just extent versioning, control is going to be a thing, and it's going to start with celebrities, and it's going to be all of us. And because like, like there's such a monetizable thing for anybody from an OnlyFans model to you know Kanye to you know any of these people, Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know who would want to chat with Mark Zuckerberg for like let me pay to do that to chat with the AI of Mark Zuckerberg, but like. Yeah, so it's just gonna be a thing, and it's like, and we're already seeing it. So, like we like wow. this time we moved so like a lot of the stuff like we would have put in the future, but it's like no, this time it was just so obvious that like future's now. Like this is happening yeah. now. It doesn't make sense to yeah. put this in the future anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah we're in a weird phase where I feel like you can. It feels like you can only see like two or three years ahead. Like it's, it's like the future is now, but like seeing anything past this is quite difficult. Yeah. yeah. No, 100%. That this, uh, I, I can't remember the exact stat, but character AI had like one of the highest engagements of any AI models was character AI. Like it wasn't miles away from open AI, like I had ChatGPT4. Like it's, um, it was pretty impressive how like people spend a lot of time <laughs> talking to these already, which is definitely hashtag surreal. Like, yeah, I like, I... go ahead. Sorry, Rebecca. go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say like, I, just in, in this famous people's list, like eight, what is, does like 8.7 million conversations for Billie Eilish mean like actual like conversations or like eight point? Cause like, I'm just wondering like, what are they talking? What are they talking about? Um, and like why Billie Eilish of like this whole list? Um, I are imagine those, that just those... means that like a younger age group, but I don't know. Yeah. With like the a... surrealism, like I've been dying to write my next article on, um, kayfabe, like, which is like, if you don't know the term for, uh, it's like professional wrestling. 
something that we know is fake, but the fakeness contributes to the entertainment value of what it is that I'm consuming. So like the fakeness is what's interesting about it. Like that's what I want. So culture all over is like getting the kayfabeification. And like, so I really want to write an article on that and I won't do it critically, right? I won't just say like, this is, this is bad or they won't be like a, like, oh my God, what's happening? It won't be from that yeah. place. It'll be from a more like, like curious place. Like what is this do, doing for people? What's happening? You know, cause it, it's just like the next couple of, it's just, it's all the deep fake stuff too. It's like, we are entering this like kayfab, kayfabe world. And like, wow, you know, that's just like, that's pretty new. Well, let me ask you about this kayfabe, like the wrestling, was that, I know it was pop culture, but I still always felt it was kind of fringe. And that's why I felt like we kind of are hedging against or hedged against what you're describing, because you either really like that stuff or you really cringe at that stuff. Like it doesn't do enough for you or it, it makes you, you know, it's in the uncanny valley or whatever. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but you think, do you think like it's a big enough section of society? Yeah, I think the challenge will be to find things like, you know, um, like dupe culture, like we don't care about fake luxury anymore. And so yeah. things that like cross over so you can extend the concept. Um, but yeah, I think right now we can laugh at this, but I think we won't even serious yeah. people won't in like seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine, ten years, you know, so it's like the it's super obvious that culture is moving in like surrealist it's it's k kayfabe is really close to surrealism right it's like we're going there and i think like if we wanted to i don't have to write an article about this this could be our report like i'd like yeah. to maybe move away from age of agency i think you know like well we can talk yeah. about that at the designated hour but yeah. yeah i just think that this surrealism thing in this deck and kayfabe it's just it's it's like it's the moment now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it makes me think that like we're not going to go to the metaverse. The metaverse is kind of like coming to us in a sense, you know, where like reality is <laughs> yeah. just becoming so strange, it might as well be. The next one, um, if you're living in Oklahoma and you want to take a cruise, you can have uh, Gen AI's personal invite to, this is a really smart execution from Virgin. Go to this website, you tell her what to say, you tell, and you get the email and send it off. And like, they get this greeting from um, Jennifer Lopez encouraging them to, you know, take a virgin cruise. Just, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more stuff like this too. And I don't know who she is. Um, I don't know who Karen is, but like, here you go. This is, this is, this is, I like, this is already happening. This will like, this is another version of that. And I think a lot of influencers are going to start to do this. It doesn't have to necessarily be to date, right? Like there's yeah. again, just like, you don't need to narrowly skin this technology in that way. If people want to date you, they can. But if they just want to talk to you, they can do that. They can do that too. And it's not just going to be celebrities. It's going to then trickle down to influencers and eventually regular people. You know, like one of the nuances here, which I think is kind of interesting of like, because I, I compare that a little bit to like writing a book, you know, a lot of like influencers, especially the, the more intellectual ones, they might, their work will culminate in writing a book. Whereas now it seems that maybe the new model is it culminates in building an AI of yourself. And it's like the difference between those is quite profound and that one is a very refined thinking that you finesse, finesse, finesse. Whereas the other is ex extremely raw. You know, you're just capturing raw data and representing that. And I think it's just kind of interesting that we're moving away from deep and nuanced to just raw and unfiltered. And I don't know what that does over time, but like the information <laughs> diet of the average American, for example, has, you know, it's like <laughs> less nutrition. Like it's just, it's, it's different, you know? They're just making this a separate app. I think it's smart. Um, yeah. they're not going to cross streams and, you know, I, I, I bet this is, we're a little old for it, but you never know. I'm just curious to see who adopts this. Um, I came across this campaign, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's basically an, an ad campaign for a new type of FDA approved, like, uh, injectable. Um, so it's called Daxify, but they created, they used like chat GBT to like, you know, write a couple like breakup lines to help you like break up with Botox or whatever. And they also like created like a 30 second jingle, um, which is kind of interesting uh, and funny. Um, but yeah, just like a fun little ad campaign for a new, um, for a new type of injectable that's in the market now. Mm. Um, and then I also came across this recently that Prada is going to be launching makeup and skincare. 
Um, I just, it's like interesting. I, it sounds like they used to do, I could be wrong. Did they used to have Prada Beauty in the past or and they're like bringing it back again or something like that now? Um, I might be wrong, but thought it's interesting. Just like obviously Prada is like so known for like fashion and things like that and makeup and, and they have like a very distinct look and style. So, you know, to see all these colors on in the pans is actually kind of interesting. I don't know. I don't know what that feels very Prada. Yeah, like the it's like these are colorways for their outfits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, uh, it's very new, but um, so we'll see. But they say, yeah, abandoning all the cliches of the past, we believe that beauty is a representation of one's personality, freedom, and self confidence. We've heard that many times, but um, we'll see, I guess, how it goes. This is just concentric circles of uh, of absurdity as well. You may have seen this. Um, Snoop Dogg is leveraging, uh, his board ape number 6723 NFT, uh, and creating an ice cream out of it. So here you're seeing brands backed by NFTs, like, you know, like NFTs are their own brands to an extent. And then here, we're going to use that as an asset to back a brand and try to bring that into, into the world backed by Snoop Dogg and it's ice cream. You know, it's like, uh, it's just, it's, it's an interesting confluence. Uh, same thing here, just in, like millennials have killed jewelry. Um, and this is a Crocs engagement ring. Crocs is getting in, in on the party. Um, I just think it's, it's, it's bonkers. <laughs> a couple of things Google, uh, Google's doing. It's just interesting to see how quickly this has changed. Cause I, in about uh, one of these brand watches two, three months ago, maybe four months ago, most, there was a story about Levi's using AI to generate models in every different um, race um, and size, and people panned yeah. them for that. But like, yeah. uh, you know, everybody's going to be using this technology, and then Google's version here is is getting, you know, like I feel like culturally we've already kind of accepted that and moved on. But that was the first sort of time when, um, you know we were talking about replacing people mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and there's a journalist assistant. It'd be interesting to see what that actually is, uh, what Genesis is, but Google is pitching this to major news organizations. Um, you know, poor journalists, they really had a rough, rough row of it. Um, this, uh, it's just making it very easy for you to release a song in multiple languages simultaneously that matches the melody using AI to um, the local language. And so you can just pump out the same song in many different languages very, very easily. Um, so I, I, who takes advantage of this? It'll be interesting to see. Obviously this is catered towards the American market. I'm not surprised that like this is originating in K-pop uh, from Korea, but um, obviously that sort of thing will go um, both ways. And you know, we already have emojis as like a universal language so what about some sort of like maybe sigaros was ahead of their time singing in a made-up language like will we have like a universal ai language i don't know like maybe is that I don't how think you it... pronounce that band's name because i never that's how i've always pronounced it i don't know if that's right <laughs> i've always said sigaros but that me too i feel like the way you just said it sounds more right <laughs> i don't know more accurate yeah i don't think it's sigaros <laughs> i don't know it's not it's not as simple as that <laughs> oh, duplicate. Oh, future signals. Um, I came across this one a little while ago. It's yeah, really interesting. The first babies conceived with a sperm injecting robot that um have been born. Just, you know, the advancement of like technology and obviously like, you know, reproduction and medicine and all of those combined. Um, it said like, you know, they use a Sony PlayStation 5 controller to position the robotic needle, which I thought was an interesting choice. Um, but yeah, just a, you know another signal of just where technology and medicine is going um, and that it's possible to birth um, children via robots. So um, yeah. I mean, this combined with IGF is pretty crazy. Um, you know, the... Uh... It, it's, you know, there's such a conversation that's starting to brew around population collapse. Um, but at the same time, we've got a lot of, you know, great fertility tech coming. I, my guess is it wouldn't make much difference, but it's interesting. 
this speaking of detoxification and cocoonification i think this is probably going to be pretty big in the future and especially if we're spending more time in digital realms like you're going to want to bring the outside in you're going to want to like optimize uh for biophilic design to uh, make your environment a place of wellness and i like what this nods to here in the second paragraph of how the scope of this industry is vast because it incorporates all of these things interior design smells textures sounds art to create something that is specifically designed for for wellness by utilizing um, nature and natural principles um, the well home i you know i found them through this so i'm I think I'm going to mention them in this article about feeling that I'm working on as well. So, yeah. So, you know, before we freak out about this being negative, it's not, this is just uh, uh, um, the incentives here. So I think maybe it's just because I'm an economics major. And so I have incentives drilled into me. So if you want to understand the future, you have to understand the incentives. So uh, political scientists and a legal scholar are um, analyzing how AI technology could um, disrupt elections. And this was the most like, I think, um, detailed, accurate, and specific way that that will happen. Because again, the incentives are there for this. So why wouldn't this happen? Like, you know, it, it will. So essentially, you can use micro targeting techniques and based upon your browser history and your social media history to individually target commercial and political ads um, to hundreds of millions of voters individually with the power of AI. And, um, you know, you can use the LLMs to generate text, social media, email, perhaps soon to be images and videos as well, all designed for you. And um, that's such a powerful, you know, technological system that I feel is incompatible with democracy, right? Because it's like, not everyone is going to be susceptible to this, but a lot of people are, you know, like, and a lot of people vote. And if this can fire people up to vote, you know, like, so I don't even know how, if we wanted to regulate this, I'm not even sure how we could at this point. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just something. No, this is, this is definitely interesting. You've already talked about it, how like, you know, language is the operating system of democracy. We have language intelligence. Um, you're right. Like it is a, a profoundly existential question because like you don't even need to change 51% of people's minds. You actually need to change about 100,000 people in Idaho's minds. Um, and that's that's kind of where it's at right now. And so like, it's, it's um, I don't know, you're right in that like, it's how would you, that's the real challenge. A lot of people, there's a whole discussion, how do you even go about regulating these things? And also like, because you could argue that like convincing someone to buy your toilet paper is totally above board, but you know, application and political advertisement is not. And like, and then that becomes like, how do you police what version of an AI they use to do that market? It just, you have to get into the nuts and bolts of the whole marketing infrastructure to have a major difference here. So like, it's a legally a very difficult thing to address. So yeah, watch that space, I guess. Mm -hmm. And nobody manipulates for good, right? Like you manipulate for bad and why can't we do this same thing to try to convince people that other people are awesome and your enemies are great and we should love each other, but nobody's going to do that. But like, you know, we're not fighting on equal mm -hmm. footing, you know, cause like there's going to be this and then it's like, how do you ensure a positive future? You should use the same means, but ethically it's a whole, it's a whole deal. I mean, the future is going to be wild. So, yeah. I think what we need is maybe an AI detox. Um, I do feel that it's just, um, it just won't un it won't unfold the way that we think it will. I feel like the only thing I'm almost certain that won't happen is what I assume will happen. Uh, this one, it's good to see this is happening. Much like four day work week studies, same thing. You've got to gather data. You've got to do limited trials of universal basic income to you know get a wider case going. And in the UK, this, that's that's happening right now. Two year study. Um. This one, I think I had in a different section, but uh, I guess it can just stay here. Um, just essentially that like private equity is moving into the sort of as like sort of the um, aesthetic services space, and that there are you know obviously both pros and cons to that because most of most of them big like the med spas are usually like private owns like mom and pop type stuff. Um, 
but yeah, there, you know, there's obviously a lot of money here in this space. And so, you know, people are like kind of moving in and yeah, again, the fear is that, you know, who is it going to, is it going to make it more difficult to make sure people are following the rules and not just putting profit over patient safety, things like that. So yeah. Yeah. I see that happening. Private equity is getting such a bad rap Mm. right now for some of these crazy examples of them just destroying valuable companies. I kind of don't know how it wouldn't happen here too. Um, This one I just came across uh, before this call. So Instagram is working on um, labeling content created or modified by AI. um, And uh, it'll be interesting in terms of, yeah, you'll be able to tell like similarly to how people start putting like hashtag ad or like sponsored on post to prove that you are either creating this content for getting paid but by getting paid by it or just because you wanted to create it um similar thing with like whether this thing content was created by ai or not um we're probably going to see more and more of this i guess like ways to signal that like either when things are like real or not real because it's clearly getting very difficult to you know see the difference so yeah. yeah um this one's a little bit more optimistic uh you know obviously this is a long ways away but apparently there was a new p- uh, paper published this week explaining how um there's like this i'm not a medical person so i have no idea but essentially like how like molecules they could turn molecules that drive cancer growth into cancer killers so basically trying to reverse the effects of growth um and uh yeah i just thought that was like kind of cool i don't know exactly again how it works but (laughs) i thought that was that sounded like good news to me at least so Mm. Okay, last, I think this is the last slide, maybe. Um, I just thought this was cute because then obviously belongs in like the future signals section. Um, Vice asked a bunch of kids like what they thought 2050 will be like, um, ages 8 to 10. And I just included a couple of those and a few of those in here. Sophia 10 said, um, he, the person asked like, will school be different? She said, I don't think so. It's not getting worse now, but there are schools where they use tablets and everything. And she was like, he asked like, you know, do you like them? And then she says, no, I prefer notebooks. Tablets are bad for your eyes. Um, it's kind of cute. And then Leonardo, 10 years old, um, the person asked, like, what bad things do you think will happen? <laughs> he says, well, I heard if we don't save the earth in a few, few years, it'll be too late. So when I'm 30, I don't think I'll be here anymore. It's a little sad. But um, but then right after that, the person asked, like, okay, you're eating a hot dog. Do you think there'll still be hot dogs? He says, definitely, but vegetarian ones. Everything will be vegetarian for sure. And would you like that? Because you're eating a sausage right now um as yes i know but i need to eat meat because i have low iron and then so when asked like if everything is vegetarian and you need iron what will you do it's like well i'll take medicine it's very simple <laughs> answer um lewis or louis i'm not sure uh age 11 you know what do you think the future will be like i think there'll be flying cars and robots like some things just never change i feel like i everybody and when everybody was kids we were seeing this um yeah and then we're in the woods right now do you think nature will always look like this And then they say, no, everything will be made of metal. The trees will be metal. Yes. Will clothes be made out of metal too? It's like, no, they'll be wood. So, you know, a little bit of a difference. (laughs) That's cute. Um, So, yeah, it's cute. Yeah. So that's that's it, I think. Man, every one of these presentations just has a very different tenor. Everyone. Great stuff, guys. This was great, guys. Really Mm -hmm. well done. Sure.